going to read a quote as my test. As the Secretary General of the United Nations and organizations of the 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants <laughs> of planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon to be taught if we are fortunate. We know full well that our planet and all its inhabitants are but a small part of the immense universe that surrounds us. And it is with humility and hope that we take this step. Welcome everyone to the Science Circle and our ongoing series of presentations. Uh, recently, we have learned about science and religion, um, the Fermi paradox. Um, we had a presentation on sci-fi films, and then most recently on the Cambrian explosion. Um, so a wide range of enjoyable topics. Today, we have a special event uh, to take a deeper dive into one of our more popular topics, science fiction. Our recent discussion only touched on the surface of this fun topic. Um, and uh, I think we were all hungry for a little more at the end last time. So um, we are uh, lucky to have with us um, our uh, previous uh, panel, um, uh, Syzygy, Tagline, and, and Mike, um, who back to um, You know, help us explore this uh, further. Um, uh, I would uh, let me give you a little uh, brief information about our panelists. I'm not sure we did that last time, so I want to make sure um, everyone sort of has an appreciation of the expertise we're able to bring you here at the Science Circle. Um, so, uh, um, tagline um, is a. a, a well known to us science circle students. Um, he has a background in mathematics, but uh, professionally is a, a physician surgeon or by career. Um, he was a former associate professor at Aegis University School of Medicine and has written a variety of clinical papers and book chapters in biophysics as well. Um, our other panelist, Mike Shaw, um, let me see, has a degree in chemistry um, uh, from uh, uh, and um, a PhD in organometallic chemistry. Um, these are all from top notch institutions, by the way, but for purposes of sort of maintaining privacy, I'm not going to give too many specifics. Um, uh, and also was a uh, lecturer in uh, organometallic chemistry. Um, and um, he's currently a distinguished research professor. Um, and finally, our next panelist, uh, Syzygy, who I think is also well known to us. Um, he is an astronomer specializing in the study of nearby galaxies at millimeter wavelengths. How badass is that? Um, and he has an, a PhD in astronomy also. Um, so uh, now it's my understanding that one thing uh, we can expect today is a look at the science behind science fiction. And I think we'll all be able to appreciate that. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, panelists uh, for their opening remarks and presentation. I may inject occasionally to voice something from the student chat. Um, and uh, I don't know if the panelists have already decided on who would like to speak first. My thought was to begin with tagline, but let me know if uh, you guys have um, a different uh, one. I want to approach it differently. All right. Very good, yes. Okay, so let's uh, let's begin with tagline. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I um, had slides I'd made for the first presentation, but um, 
I was too uh, inexperienced to be able to get the projector to work properly. So uh, our co-panelists here were kind enough to uh, look at my slides and suggested that we show them in a second setting. I'm going to have to be careful not to click too much so that they get out of order. I don't want to just read them to you. Um, the first few will be a bit of a review of some of the discussion from before about what fiction is. And I tend to think of it in terms of literature. Um, I'll let you read it for yourself, as I mentioned. And fiction and fantasy are related, but a bit different. Um, fantasy can be like Grimm's fairy tales. Most people would not consider those science fiction. Although in um, modern uh, views of fiction, anything that is marketed as fiction can be considered fiction. Um, and science fiction is sort of speculative fiction often based on technology and science of the day and especially how it affects humanity and the future of humanity. Um, uh, here's what I was mentioning. Uh, Isaac Asimov uh, in 75 um, spoke of science fiction as anything published as um, science fiction. Um, it, it, an example of how the, and that broadens the uh, genre, I, I felt um, the man in the high castle uh, story which is an alternative history loosely based on Philip K. Dick's work, could be classified as sci-fi. And sci-fi has a lot of, um, of um, sub-genres, which I list here in a few slides, about three slides. Uh, again, I'll just let you glance over them. Uh, I don't think there'll be great in, uh, surprises, and I tried to give a few examples uh, in uh, cross genre is um, pretty big. So it's hard to uh, define it. Um, this, I think, is the last of the slides showing the list of subgenres of uh, sci fi. I didn't really want to dwell on that, but I wanted to begin by telling you about um, the uh, movies we had uh, chosen. I'll just give a brief introduction. This was one I had chosen. It's from 1951, The Day the Earth Stood Still. It was remade with Kenar Reeves, but I like this one. And basically, what you see in this slide is um, Klaatu. Klaatu is this guy who shows up with his 10 foot robot with the power to destroy the solar system and a spaceship landing in Washington, D.C. And he has a simple message that uh, uh, for the monkey boys that like to make bombs and blow each other up, uh, uh, cut it out with the atomic weapons and uh, with their belligerence towards uh, the world. And uh, if they don't, they, uh, were, they're going to be uh, destroyed. And he soon comes to realize that these guys won't listen. These guys being all of us. So uh, he has to make an example. And uh, yeah, we could we could uh, stand a visit. Uh, we could we could use some help from Superman too. I've thought that often. Uh, but uh, any rate, he shuts the mother down for a day. I'm talking about Mother Earth. And uh, he had to get their attention. And then. He leaves, and basically, it's you know I am take it or leave it, you know, and it's uh, we'll be back if you don't listen. And so it was an extraordinary movie, and uh, uh, I like the original actually much better than the remake. Uh, there are a lot of taglines, but uh, my favorite two, I like taglines. <laughs> uh, a succinct statement of what a, the idea behind a movie is. From out of space, 
a warning and an ultimatum. And uh, you have to imagine this was uh, the message to people from um, uh, the era of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. So warnings and ultimatums were taken to heart. And the other was, what is this invader from another planet? Can it destroy Earth? And I guess the answer is yes. At any rate, it's a cool movie. I really recommend it if you can get it. I own a copy. Invasion of the Body Snatchers was another one I liked a lot. Uh, it's set in San Francisco, and uh, Mr. Spock is in it as a psychiatrist, I think. And um, I apologize for the telephone. Uh, it is a remake from uh, a 1950s movie about uh, uh, the uh, fear of immigrants. And um, um, I, I really uh, enjoyed this one the most. I mentioned in the original meeting that I made the error of uh, showing it to my daughter when she was eight years old, and she never in her life would sleep with a plant in her room after that. The uh, idea was this um, uh, beautiful flower falls from space and gets picked up, and people admire exotic plants and will put them in water, and so they eventually fall asleep, and while they sleep, tendrils come out and envelop them. And uh, they end up getting replaced by aliens who acquire their <coughs> physiology and uh, fitness for this planet, but have their intelligence uh, and consciousness uh, running the, the show. And um, the taglines uh, for it that I like is, uh, one is, get some sleep. Well, the second tagline that uh, kind of uh, uh, counters that is, watch out, they get, it, they get you when you're sleeping. And the, the main tagline I think that uh, this movie was known for is pray for the human race. They had one striking moment in the movie when they had, um, uh, they were going down to the ships and they heard the, the uh, bagpipes playing Amazing Grace. And you had this thought that, yeah, the human race is going to make it. And then they saw that these pods were being put onto the ships to be uh, uh, transferred to all the continents. So this was a global invasion and takeover. Uh, so let's see here. Here's some pictures from it. And, you know, embryology is not that pretty. Sorry, there's Spock talking to Donald Sutherland. And this is after Donald Sutherland had become one of them. And he was seeing somebody that was still human. So my next movie is The Fly. This is from 1986. The tagline in this I like the most is, help me, please help me. Uh, Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis were out, outstanding in this. Um, another tagline I really liked in this was, something went very wrong in the lab today. Very wrong. And so Jeff Goldblum plays this um, brilliant scientist, Seth Brundle, who um, develops this teleporter that can move him from one spot to another in space and reassemble him and he ends up getting a fly in uh in the teleporter with him and he gets genetic information from the fly and uh yeah it, it, jeff goldblum became like a sex machine as he was morphing into an insect uh he could buzz all night so to speak so let's see here a few pictures from that that's jeff at the beginning the metamorphosis in this was really extraordinary, and the pod is sort of fun. It's like, you know, it makes you want to just kind of hop in there and have a cup of tea and see what it feels like. Uh, 
and uh, here is uh, when he's uh, <laughs> he's uh, digesting his rival with his vomit, uh, like flies do. They vomit and then suck up the uh, uh, they vomit out the digestive enzymes and then suck up the uh, liquid. They can't chew, and so he goes through some changes. <laughs> So the next was Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is a movie I really loved. Uh, and um, it's along the same lines of Limitless. If you've seen Limitless, Limitless was by about a nootropic. Nootropics are uh, pharmaceutical agents, usually, uh, that can enhance cerebral activity. Um, in this, they have a technology by which they can erase memories. And there are experiments by uh, which they try to reduce the chance of post-traumatic stress syndrome, for instance, giving sedatives. Like they did in all the old British movies, they, whenever someone had had a shock, they, the doctor would sedate them with some morphine. And that actually probably saved them a lot of grief uh, uh, because that helped inhibit the memory from getting embedded. Um, so this is the device that erases a memory. And um, in this case, these um, uh, individuals, um, Kate Winslet and uh, uh, Carrie, Jim Carrey, uh, they're an item and um, their relationship goes sour. So they try to erase each other and then they regret it and they can't stop the process. But in the end, it comes to a conclusion, this movie, that uh, you tend to have the same response because of who you are, even if you don't have the memories, as they encounter one another again and um, hit it off. The same attraction is there. But it's a fantastic movie. Then The Matrix, which I am sure everybody knows about, was really stunning. One of the things I really liked about this um, um, is the movie um, uh, Club to Death. Uh, uh, it is, it's the theme music, uh, Club to Death. Uh, if you are aware of what that is, you can find it on YouTube, Club to Death. It's really big music and um, dramatic. So the tagline in this is, the, use, the future is not user-friendly. That was on an Australian poster. Basically, most people know the story that um, Ken Reeves is uh, a, um, um, a hacker, um, a computer hacker uh, at night, and um, I guess a programmer in the day. Uh, he was Mr. Anderson, Thomas Anderson, uh, but he, um, his handle as a hacker is Neo, and so his persona in most of the movie is uh, Neo, but in The Matrix, when he's dealing with these computer programs that are so treacherous, they always call him Mr. Anderson, and uh, uh, it's a fascinating evaluation or, or, or um, study of uh, perceptions and um, the difficulty in determining what truly is real. Um, then we come to, I'll show a few, these are matrix pictures. I should be flipping through them as I talk. If I could do two things at once, I'd be all up to date here. I'm not sure what that is. Now we have Gattaca, which was 1997 and was uh, really quite a movie. As a genetically inferior man assumes the identity of a superior one in order to pursue his lifelong dream of space travel. Uh, Ethan Hawke was the uh, superior man. Personally, I found myself distracted by Uma Thurman. Uh, quite a bit, but uh, uh, that's that's me talking, I guess. Uh, uh, 
in society, if you weren't up to snuff genetically, you would become a menial uh, individual who uh, does, uh, or an underclass person who does menial jobs. And so uh, the tagline is shown here that uh, is most prominent, the prisoner, his cell. In other words, we're in, entrapped by our cell biology, which is all determined by uh, nucleic acids, of course. So these are pictures of he tortures himself to do uh, this identity theft, or it's not really a theft of an identity. It's because uh, he gets the assistance of the individual who is Jude Law, who's sitting in the wheelchair behind him. He's sitting on a mobile contraption, and this guy is having his his uh, height and uh, increased by uh, devices on his legs. And there's a interesting artistic juxtaposition there. There's a lot of that in this movie. Uh, so, well, uh, it it is it was a gift in a sense, identity gift. Uh, that's a good point. I. Uh, identity theft is just the term so often used um, in society anymore. Then we have uh, iRobot, which uh, the tagline that I actually like quite a lot is laws were made to be broken. Sort of like motor motorcycles were made to be ridden. Uh, it, it's in the, H, uh, the uh, year 2035, a technophobic cop investigates a crime that may have been perpetuated by a robot, which leads to a larger threat to humanity. And um, it, it, it deals with conspiracy and, and larger threats to humanity than just the one crime, or else it wouldn't have been such a movie. It uh, had a 7.1 rating on IMDb. It's worth seeing if you haven't seen it. Um, these are pictures from it. Now, Extinction, I have not seen. It's from 2018. It had an IMDb rating of 5.8, which doesn't mean it's not a good movie, but um, that's the, uh, the people that are signed up on uh, the Internet Movie Database, IMDb. Uh, do the uh, 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 ratings. Uh, the tagline for that is, we were not here first. Um, and it's a, a, about a father who has a recurring dream of losing his family and this nightmare turns out to be uh, prophetic and real rather than paranoid and, um, and the earth is being uh, invaded. Um, um, and the invaders are bent on destruction, but he has some uh, ability uh, hidden in himself that he apparently discovers that uh, helps uh, develop the story. I don't know how the story ends. Um, Oidoropa Report, uh, let me flip through these. These are from Extinction. Uh, Europa Report, 2013. Uh, these are pictures from that. It's an international crew of astronauts undertakes a privately funded mission to search for life on Jupiter's fourth largest moon. The uh, taglines are fear, sacrifice, and contact. Uh, so it's a manned mission to Europa to search for data proving the existence of life there. Um, it shows difficult choices and sacrifices the crew has to make to fulfill the objective of sending valuable data to Earth for research. So, okay, Ex Machina, I liked quite a lot. And um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, Vanderkamp, I think is her name, uh, the um, young lady who played the, the robot in it, I thought did a marvelous job. And uh, in this, um, uh, I guess the main tagline would be, I'm sorry for the noise from my computer, 
the main tagline would be that um, there is nothing more human than will to survive. And uh, the whole thing was sort of an examination of a Turing test, but more. And uh, uh, she had this as um, an individual with artificial intelligence and self-realization, apparently, she wanted to live and wanted to have her own life and didn't want to be contained. Uh, it's an extraordinary movie as well. So, and let's see, 2001, we're getting close to the end of the movies. Uh, 2001, everyone knows of from 1968, uh, tumultuous year in the world. Um, and the tagline for it uh, on uh, the remake or the re-release of it was 50 years ago, one movie changed all movies forever. I guess 2018 it was re-released, um, which happens to be this year, I, I realize. Uh, and the, the I think the original tagline was an epic drama of adventure and exploration. And it's about man colonizing... Uh, uh, man has a colony on the moon, and uh, they are uh, trying to uh, 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 investigate uh, what uh, is going on. Uh, I think it was Europa as well in that movie, and uh, there was an, a computer that um, appeared to be... Um, imbued with artificial intelligence and self-realization named Hal. And of course, if, uh, sorry for all these noises my laptop makes here and this telephone in the background. Um, Hal, if you do a transposition of one letter, it's IBM uh, in decoding. The uh, Final movie, let me flip through the pictures. In 1968, these were extraordinary uh, pictures. And Stan, Stanley Kubrick, if you have a chance to see really anything he produced in, during his life, I would encourage, go for it. Surrogates was a fun, interesting movie. It only got 6.3 on IMDb. It was from 2009. Bruce Willis was in it. and um, the idea is people can live their lives remotely uh, in the safety of their own home, looking grubby and unshaven and uh, sort of semi-awake, lying down on uh, lazy boys or whatever those chairs are. Um, and uh, they have surrogates that are um, carrying out their lives for them. And... Uh, the tagline for this was human perfection, what could go wrong? So in a sense, the uh, uh, surrogates were the um, uh, uh, perfect. Um, there's Bruce Willis as a surrogate. He's younger in his hair. And uh, he gives it up. And finally, he was like the only one uh, uh, walking around um, who was real. Now, I wanted to do a quick run through of 14 slides that I think relate to something here. One was, I like stamps, and the DDR uh, was uh, uh, the East German Republic is no longer in existence. It's always fun to collect stamps from uh, governments that no uh, longer exist. But Kekul, he always went by August. He, he uh, didn't use his first name, but... Uh, uh, he was trying to figure out uh, his father, the father of uh, organic chemistry. It's around 1865. He was trying to figure out what kind of an element would have six carbons and six hydrogens and would be more stable than the uh, what you would call an aliphatic type molecule. He had a uh, dream of a snake swallowing its own tail. Um, I give you the word for it up there, um, and I'll point out in the stamp on the left uh, the uh, um, benzene 
which is what he was looking at, a six carbon ring with alternating double bonds um, has, uh, a, has the ability uh, to explained in what's called resonance, resonance theory. Uh, if you look at the stamp on the right, it shows the double bonds having flipped to the adjacent um, inner space between carbons. And in a sense, when you have the um, uh, probability uh, distribution of electrons uh, spread out that way, you end up with a more stable uh, 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 structure. Uh, there's uh, having, having the bonds all in one place and, and in a fixed way is, you could think of it in a sense as less probable, I guess. So benzene uh, can lead to a lot of other things. Uh, benzene was used um, as a solvent and it causes cancer and all sorts of things, but uh, um, so much of organic chemistry depends on it. And you have pyridine, which is um, like, uh, comes from coal tar and that sort of stuff. Uh, coal gasification led to pyridine, but uh, I already flipped forward, I'm afraid there. Um, the pyridine has uh, uh, a single nitrogen. Now, if you get a, a, a two nitrogens, you've got a class of molecules called diazines. Once again, these are all sort of like benzene. So I'm trying to get you to think of benzene, then one nitrogen stuck in there still has a resonant molecule. And because it resonates, you don't have, you have a sort of hybridized SP uh, um, uh, electron clouds. And these are flat molecules. They're, they don't have the, they lose the tetrahedral quality or distribution of the, uh, of the um, carbon uh, when it's single bonds. So, uh, you can have uh, a, on the left uh, a para uh, orientation with two adjacent nitrogens or a meta or ortho on the right. The meta is in the middle. That one is particularly import, uh, important or interesting. Protonated uh, here just means it has a hydrogen on it, but the, ni the nitrogen um, at the one and three, you start at the one nitrogen and you count so that you get the lowest number to the next nitrogen. And so it's a one, three diazine. Now I point out um, uh, azot, I guess I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Um, but I'm typing this in is the French word for nitrogen. So uh, when you see AZ, AZO or AZI, um, think of nitrogen. Uh, and that relates to Lavoisier uh, realizing when there's no oxygen that uh, organisms can't survive in gas. So it's really important these are planar. Uh, that resonance, uh, it's, it's heterocyclic, uh, meaning that it's a, si a circle with more than one kind of atom, and it's aromatic, meaning it has alternating uh, uh, double bonds that can resonate, and um, it's more stable. So you have this pyrimidine 1,3, or uh, pyrimidine is 1,3 diazine. Um, to remember that a diazine is a six uh, uh, atom ring, think of benzene. And from this, if you note, you have, these are all one, three diazines, and you put on functional groups in certain ways, and you come up with uh, uh, pyrimidines. And uh, for some reason, my uh, CUT, I have a point to make about CUT that uh, I'll go into. Here are the pyrimidines shown with uh, three-dimensional models adjacent to them, and the numbering of the, of the atoms is shown. And so with pyrimidines, think of benzene. I'll tell you something which sounds stupid. When I first learned this, I thought of, it's interesting, you have pyrimidines and purines. 
Well, purines are it's a smaller word and it's the bigger molecule. Pyrimidines the bigger name and the smaller molecule. It's a single ring. Now, if you take an octagon, uh, this is a way of thinking of it. If you're kind of spatial, you have six points on an octagon, just like you have six atoms on uh, uh, benzene or uh, pyridine or uh, pyrimidines. And if you cut uh, a pyramid in half, you get two pyramids. So uh, if you can remember the word cut, uh, I, I, I didn't mean if you cut an octagon in half through four points, you get two pyramids, which are equal faces and a square base. Uh, so if you remember CUT, uh, that will help you remember which of the um, 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 nitrogenous bases are pyrimidines. It's just a mnemonic device that I'll share with you. It's I don't. It's one I used uh, back when. Uh, now diazole is another class. If let's just think of five a ring of five uh, atoms, and in this case a diazole with two nitrogens, just like with the pyrimidine, uh, the one three uh, diazine, you have one three diazole. Uh, that's imidazole. And uh, it has re resonance that where it can uh, switch its uh, conformation of electron uh, sharing uh, uh, in different forms on, uh, shown on the bottom there, and that helps give it stability as well. So my point is, if you, uh, I don't have these oriented right, but if you just move them around in your mind, um, you combine uh, the pyrimidine structure with um, uh, like the uh, matching up the uh, 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 open uh, open carbons uh, with open carbons on the uh, imidazole. Uh, and remember AZO means it's an organic molecule with nitrogen in it. Uh, you come up with a purine. A purine is a double ring and each one has two nitrogens in it. It's a six ring and a five ring, and it's resonant and planar. The fact that it's planar um, is really important in that it lets um, it be used in um, the DNA and RNA structure. It, uh, it's, it fits the uh, geometry of it. Oh, let's see here. Here's just one more picture of it. Uh, so you have the... Uh, uh, pyrimidine shown, and then uracil, which is only in uh, RNA. Thymine uh, is uh, in DNA only. Um, so kind of remember those two get uh, switched off. And cytosine, uh, uh, those are all the three pyrimidines. And then the purine structures include adenine and guanine. Um, Nucleotides uh, have a ribose molecule. Ribose is a five uh, mo monosaccharide, uh, 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 five carb uh, carbon chain. Uh, and uh, in this case, it's cyclic with an ester bond there. Um, and uh, if you have, um, you can have these, uh, uh, um, Nucleobases or uh, um, um, nitrogenous bases attached to uh, the uh, uh, one uh, carbon on the ribose, and um, uh, you notice here there's um, on the second between that. Um, you, if you look at the base on the upper right, and you have um, a hydroxyl group hanging down, there's a little. Um, uh, Oh, I touched my screen. Uh, well, you can see it here. Um, ah. Well, it's back. Good. Uh, the uh, you you have a, at the at the two carbon on the sugar, you have a hydroxyl group that is gone in DNA. 
One reason that is gone in DNA is the oxygen hydroxyl group in DNA would make DNA less stable. DNA needs to be more stable. And also that part of the DNA tends to be turned out. The outer uh, sh uh, uh, spine of DNA is sugar to phosphodiester to sugar. And uh, they're connected at the uh, three prime uh, ca uh, carbon to a five prime carbon. And this one, it shows uh, a phosphorus attached attached to the five carbon. Um, uh, if you have the hydrogen uh, instead of a hydroxyl group there, it makes it more hy uh, hydrophobic uh, and less hydrophilic. Uh, RNA uh, is better suited for uh, being out in the cy uh, cytoplasm, and um, although there, I guess prokaryotic cells don't have a nuclear membrane, um, but uh, uh, they don't last as well. They don't, they're not durable like DNA is, uh, as they have different function too. One other interesting thing is that RNA can fold on itself. This is just one more picture with the, I liked it because it numbered the carbons and the nitrogen atoms. Uh, but here are the double bonds. Uh, are the, are the uh, hydrogen bonds that stabilize the uh, the bases, um, and I gave a note card. It I w hope you'll take if you click on the sign to the right of the panel uh, that mentions this and how the uh, triple bonds are formed and uh, uh, or or which which uh, combinations you have uh, triple uh, hydrogen bonds, which are stabilizing but weak they're they're basically a biological zipper and uh, so that the uh, in uh, protected inner part of the DNA double helix can become uh, shown and so this all leads to this last point that if you take and I think somebody might have mentioned this the four letters for a uh, uh, adenosine, cytosine, uh, guanine, and uh, thymine, uh, uh, ACGT, and you take anagrams or combinations of those four uh, characters. Uh, when you get up to, you don't get much until you get up to about seven letters, and there you got Gattaca. So now I'll turn it over to everybody else. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, hello, this is Baragon. Uh, so that was a long way to go for that uh, payoff, but uh, it was kind of fun to, to walk through that uh, chemistry. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Tag. Uh, really uh, fun to uh, sort of uh, review uh, those movies in more detail and have a chance to respond to them. Um, we still have a little time left, so um, I do want to give our other panelists an opportunity to chime in. Um, so uh, let me uh, give uh, first uh, Syzygy a chance to maybe weigh in with uh, uh, either some additional movies he'd like to mention or to expound on what we've talked about. Uh, and then I'll give uh, Mike a chance. Why don't you in here and react to what we've just talked about. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Baragon. Hello, everyone, glad to be here again. Uh, I think, uh, uh, thank, I think, uh, I think, uh, sorry. Sorry, Sis, uh, sorry to break in. Your mic is a little high for me. Um, oh, and okay. The, and, the, and, the, and the lines over your voice dot are going into the red, so maybe see if you can uh, reduce the microphone volume. Thank you. Okay, good point. Let me see if I can do that. References. I can just also stand back from my microphone. Maybe that would help. I didn't know how powerful this mic was. I'll sit back from, from my mic a little bit. So is that better? Uh, I think that's a little better, yes. Thank you. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I just want to uh, thank uh, Tagline for his presentation. It was an interesting presentation. Uh, you, uh, he obviously put a lot of work into it. It was well organized. Um, uh, a, a lot of uh, interesting information in there. I was getting a little lost as to the the organic chemistry lesson at the end there, but uh, yeah, I, I see where it was headed. That was that was uh, that was interesting. It was uh, all leading back to Gattaca. Um, yeah, I did want to make uh, I, I did want to make uh, some comments about um, about the content uh, that maybe we can discuss. One, one thing I found really surprising about um, Isaac Asimov's um, is his definition of science fiction: anything that's published as science fiction. I mean, that's setting the bar rather low. Uh, he's he was um, he was a, a professional. Well, he he had his PhD in biochemistry, so he he was a trained scientist, and he was very competent outside his field. He wrote many books and uh, public various areas of science, so he really understood what science was, and he really understood how to write good science fiction. So it strikes me as very strange that he would set the bar so low. Now, one thing he also wrote, it's apparently in a TV Guide article in the 1970s, and uh, uh, hoping that maybe Tagline can find that. I've been looking for that online. He wrote the 10 rules for writing good science fiction. I don't know what those 10 rules are, except for number one and number 10. Number one is you don't break any known scientific laws in your stories. But number 10, I don't know what the other eight were, but number 10 was you can break any of the above rules if you know what you're doing. So on the one hand, uh, his earlier statement that uh, it's any, science fiction is anything that's published as science fiction doesn't exactly contradict his rules, but it does contradict what's good science fiction because I can point to a number of movies that um, where they pass themselves off as science fiction, but they're more like fantasy or even science fantasy. Uh, the X-Men movie, for example. These X-Men movies, I like the X-Men movies, um, but they're not really what I would call science fiction. Or even Star Wars, which is presented in in, uh, in the uh, in this in this presentation as a military science fiction, I, I would say is not really science fiction. Uh, that isn't to say that they couldn't be made into science fiction if you know what you're doing as a model's rule number 10 um that's another topic for discuss a discussion what's the difference between fantasy and science fiction you can i think turn fantasy into science fiction if you know what you're doing but the people who did these movies like star wars or say the x-men movie didn't know what they're doing with all due respect to, to the people who created those movies so um yeah, it does strike me as a little bit strange that Asimov would, would define science fiction that way. It seems a little bit in contradiction with his rules. And yes, let's pass that on for others to discuss. Um, I will just chime in with um, another anecdote uh, from Kurt Vonnegut um, in reacting to being described as a science fiction writer. I don't think he was necessarily against it, but he just quipped, well, they think I'm a science fiction writer because I know how a refrigerator works. <laughs> um, sort of taking a swipe at the idea that um, that that the I guess the mainstream literary press thinks that you know even mentioning some sort of technology in a story makes. You... Um, and uh, so now let me uh, give uh, Mike an opportunity to. Um, uh, uh, let us uh, sh uh, to share his thoughts also. So, uh, Mike, uh, why don't you take up the mic? Okay. How do I sound? Sounds good. So far, so good. Okay. Um, so, tagline: a lovely summary. Um, the uh, the the movies are all uh, top notch ones and very important in the uh, history of science uh, fiction. And uh, I'm somewhat prejudiced about chemistry at the end, so that it was a delightful summary of um, how we get from um, carbon um, up to DNA. Um, you know, one of the lovely things about uh, carbon is that it's so versatile, and it's uh, it's pretty common. Um, you know, if we look at um, if we look at the composition of the Earth's crust, there might be 
oh, I don't know, one third of it um, is silicon, but hardly any of our life uses silicon. It's carbon, even though carbon is about point, I don't know, 006 percent, don't quote me, of the Earth's crust. So carbon is going to um, outcompete silicon um, any day unless we change the uh, conditions so radically that we might not recognize um, where life comes from. So, um, yeah, I think that um, you know, when we encounter other life forms, they're going to be carbon based. And, uh, you know, there's a good chance that we might be able to even digest them. Um, you know, um, always nice to land on a planet and uh, be able to eat things from the forest without having them immediately kill us. Um, so, so, yeah, um, lovely. Lovely talk. Um, you know, in, in terms of like uh, what is science fiction, I think uh, I think you always have to uh, realize that in fiction there's going to be a little bit of an element of uh, fantasy. Um, it's very very difficult to uh, write a story that uh, uses everything we know about uh, science um, to um, uh, tell a story without introducing uh, some uh, small deviation. Even amongst the very um, hardest science um, fiction writers, there's always a speculative edge uh, to it. And the question comes, uh, when, when do you fall over the speculative edge? I mean, there's clearly some examples. I mean, Star Wars with the Force and uh, kind of that uh, quasi-mystical thing that uh, goes on, it makes for a nice, entertaining story, and I love the Star Wars movie, watch them over and over again, but, um, you know, I certainly, in my mind, classify them very differently from Europa Report, uh, 2001, or even Gattaca. So, um, let's see, tagline, it's interesting that lead is in the same group. Um, yes, absolutely, um, you know, a short answer, um, silicon lead, um, tin. The, um, the things that make them different from carbon is that um, their orbitals have internal structure that leads to repulsive forces when they get too close, and carbon doesn't. Carbon um, atoms can get really, really close to each other without experiencing repulsion. So uh, carbon can do double bonds as a, as a regular thing, and um, silicon, you can make it do um, Double bonds, but you know it's it's really quite uh, unnatural. You're not going to find that um, out um, in the environment uh, too much. So, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Baragon. Um, so far, it's been a lovely discussion. Okay, sorry, I had to turn my mic on. Uh, yes, uh, yes, thanks, uh, uh, Mike. I appreciate that very much. Um, I did have a, a further thought to something uh, Suzuki mentioned about um, Asimov's rules um, being that sci fi is what's published as sci fi. I kind of wonder whether Margaret Atwood is an exception there. And in fact, uh, you know, she was kind of in the vanguard or part of a movement of kind of social science fiction, um, really sort of in the 80s and 90s, where science fiction sort of um, looked away from technology and kind of looked at sort of futuristic societies. Um, but I'm not sure that, uh, like, um, uh, what is it, the, the whatchamacallit tale, I'm having a little brain fart here, but um, The Handmaid's Tale, I'm not sure that that was originally published as science fiction. I think it was published as literature and sort of was adopted by the sci-fi community. And, uh, also, well, I'll jump feel, on it. Um, I was I just going to say, feel, <laughs> feel free to respond in voice. <laughs> um, well, do you think something like A Handmaid's Tale is science fiction?
So, uh, you know, handmade. Uh, had, think had, it's dystopian. It is dystopian. Handmaid's Tale is arguably science fiction because the it's based in a futuristic world in which um, humanity has gone sterile, and the ability to have sort of a little bit like the Children of Men, kind of a two different takes on the same premise where humans have gone sterile, um, and so this horrible. But in the Handmaid's Tale, the response to that is takeover by a horrible right-wing evangelical culture in which, uh, you know, and so, so it's kind of based on kind of a science-y thing, you know, where we go sterile, but then uses that as a launching point for some dystopian social future. It's not technological, it's social. Well, my beef with the man in the high castle is that it doesn't have enough science. It doesn't have enough technology. I mean, they've got this amulet with with which they can travel to alternate futures or you know alternate uni alternate realities, but they hardly ever use it, and nobody really seems to care that it exists. It drives me crazy. I mean, I haven't. I'm I'm only like a couple episodes into the new season, and I'm kind of hoping. That everyone sort of wakes up to the fact that they can get, they can just transfer to this other reality. You'd be crazy. Well, thanks to your description, I should read more Margaret Atwood. I have actually read a couple of her stories. Um, um, I, I, I did want to mention, uh, talk a little bit about what um, Mike said. Uh, he said uh, there's some speculative part of, of science fiction where you have to where it's almost like a fantasy. And I suppose that's true to some extent, but if you have someone who really knows what they're doing, like Isaac Asimov, and another author I would mention is Alistair Reynolds, who's, a, who's an astronomer, um, and he, he's, he writes science fiction stories. They, they, th those stories are, are based very firmly on science, usually. Um, and it, it, you could tell it's written by a scientist um, because it, it, the science seems, um, even if it is an extrapolation beyond uh, what we know, it is, um, yes, usually, that's right. Um, sometimes they, they do go a little far afield. But you can tell them very often that these, these guys are scientists because they, uh, they it's, it looks, it seems like very firm extrapolations of, of what we know very often. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's one question that was, Dali is asking whether something like uh, Inception would be classified as science fiction. It doesn't, I don't know if, say, uh, for sure that it, would be um, anything else but science fiction. It's sort of an extrapolation about what we know about dreams. I think the the rules they have about how dreams behave in that movie are a little too firm. I don't think the, those rules necessarily apply exactly in everyone. But but yeah, you could say it's science fiction in my opinion, even if the content of the dreams are fantasies. Um, so I have a thought about The Matrix that I'd like to share. Um, I'm a fan not only of the first movie, which everyone loves, but I, in fact, like the entire trilogy. And um, one reason I do, I'm not sure if we talked about this last time or not, but, um, you know, one of the things I like about the story arc of the Matrix trilogies is that Agent Smith loses his purpose when he gets destroyed by Neo at the movie. So he's programmed without purpose, which is a contradiction. It creates an existential crisis for him. As a result, he goes rogue and becomes a threat to the machines. So, um, at, so... Um, in the third movie, what you discover is that the machines are as freaked out about Agent Smith as Neo is. and But Neo um, has a power that the machines don't have um, because he's, you know, alive. Um, and uh, so uh, um, uh, as the true one, as we learn in the second movie, 
um, you know, the iteration that the reality has iterated over and over and over again, um, where you know, the, where a one, a one has emerged and fought the machine. Genes win every, and um, but but it turns out that Neo in our trilogy is true one, and he defeats Agent Smith in an alliance with the machines. At the end, basically. You know, everyone is happy. The machines make a truce with the humans, um, and so forth. So I just think that that's a very elegant resolution to the whole dilemma of of the conflict between them. Yeah, that is an interesting way of looking at it. Um, to me, it, it could also be very, uh, very mundane. You, it's just like your laptop has a has a virus, so you you have to find antiviral software and. Right. Neo is like an organic uh, antiviral software, and <laughs> yeah. And so my my laptop's getting all freaked out about this virus running inside it. So I, I inject my my finger in, into it, and somehow I, my body provides the uh, viral software. So it's sort of like that, and you you could look at it that way too. Or at least uh, Neo has super user um, privileges and can go about deleting <laughs> the um, uh, glitchy software, Agent Smith. Yes, but let's represent that with some kind of badass in the sky world spanning fight between Neo and Agent Smith. <laughs> well, that's how I feel whenever I have to log in as root into my computer anyway. Right. That's yeah, it's just a representation of every time we launch our antivirus software. <laughs> yeah, but when you do that, when you're a super user, make sure you have these cool wraparound glasses and you have this long coat that looks really cool, right? <laughs> I might. <laughs> um, so I wanted to mention uh, we are formally authorized to extend the discussion for a few more minutes. So um, you know, feel free to um, uh, share any additional thoughts you guys have, and we can, and also the audience can feel free to chime in. Um, so I think we should uh, take try to take advantage of. And, well, uh, one thing I, I'd like to make a plug for is is uh, sometime having a, a panel discussion on the difference between fantasy and, and science fiction. As I've mentioned previously, um, a society's stories in some way define that society and uh, can also be a diagnostic of that society. And if we have a society in which we have uh, movies and, and even books being passed off as science fiction when they're really fantasy, it, it says something about the lack of scientific literacy. So uh, I, I think that's something we should about a, a panel discussion too sometime. Yeah, uh, we can get into that a little bit too because um, I'm – very on board with things like Star Wars and uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, not being science fiction. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I've always loved about Star Trek is this techno, the techno babble that it's famous for, where they try to um, sort of explain the science behind some MacGuffin in the storyline. And, um, and one reason I like it is because you can tell that they really make an effort to, like, make it seem plausible. <laughs> like, you know, they, they kind of use the right uh, little um, uh, terms and stuff like that, and, and they draw from the appropriate branch of science that they need to draw from to explain it. And even though it is just kind of babble, I just admire the effort they put in to do that at least. Yeah, science fantasy. I would call I would call Star Wars science fantasy, and science fantasies can be very, very interesting, very compelling, very, very visually uh, exciting, um, and uh, they can have interesting characters, and it can be a, an interesting thing to watch. But uh, the problem is that it's, it's they try to pass it off as science fiction, and despite, with all due respect to Isaac Asimov, I don't consider something that's passed off as science fiction to necessarily be science fiction. You know, I always wondered whether uh, Lucas set Star Wars in space, um, 
because he was inspired by Roddenberry's uh, elevator pitch for Star Trek, which was that it was wagon train in space. Sort of the idea that it's basically just a melodrama with kind of a science fiction setting. And Lucas sort of took that idea and just set a melo just set his own melodrama in space, but not really with any intention to make it science fiction. Well, Unfortunately, it is it's... passed off as science fiction, though. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things Lucas tried to do with this story uh, was to uh, follow the hero's journey um, with um, from uh, Joseph Campbell's work. The, the setting and uh, the devices used were secondary to uh, having a compelling story. Uh, I think that is actually a, um, a hallmark of um, good science fiction, good storytelling in general, um, that when you have a story that uh, is based on character and plot, um, you know, having these secondary uh, considerations of uh, setting and uh, devices, um, you know, various uh, various literary forms that um, allow the story to uh, proceed through uh, science fiction elements. Um, you know, all of all of these things can uh, uh, play the part of making a good story. If your story is just based on the technology and um, your characters are wooden. Uh, it's not going to be a successful uh, franchise. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, Syzygy mentioned Dune, and I actually want to jump on that and talk about Dune a little bit. I'm actually a big fan of the David Lynch uh, version of the uh, uh, you know, movie Dune, though it's often mocked. I actually really love it. Um, but um, so Dune... The key to interstellar space travel and contact with alien species is the spice, which is a psychoactive substance. And one of the things that's fascinating about Dune is its acknowledgement that sort of reality and, and consciousness um, are linked. Um, and that, um, that space travel is enabled by mind expansion. So I really would love to get your guys' thoughts about that. <laughs> Well, my, my particular opinion is that um, you're not with your mind going to teleport from one place to another and, and, and uh, beat the rules of space time and travel faster than the speed of light. Um, it, it's not a bad idea. Um, there are just certain parallels with what's happening in the world now because they have, they want, they have to get this spice in order to achieve this state of mind for this stellar space travel. So it's basically the fuel for their interstellar space travel and it's in a planet which is suspiciously like Saudi Arabia um, so it's it's almost like trying to get uh, petroleum from Saudi Arabia and uh, it's uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it, it, it's an interesting parallel with, with in, in, interesting uh, characters and uh, I mean the first book uh, in the Dune series I thought I thought was good and I did enjoy it um, it, it's at best what I would call soft science fiction it's sort of at the boundaries of, of fantasy and science fiction but it's um, it, it's almost like saying there's no such thing as an objective reality because your reality is is what your mind what your mind creates and uh, I'm definitely don't agree with that. But that's you know now we're getting. He who controls the spice controls the universe. Yeah, it's I been see, a long time I since I've read uh, Dune and the later ones, um, but. Uh, they are an enjoyable read, at least until um, you get too far uh, into uh, the series. And sometimes you just have to, um, you know, be forgiving of some of the devices uh, that they use. Because so, so like I just pointed, it's like if they need spice to do interstellar travel, how did they get to Dune in the first place? Uh, so that's. The fact that it's uh, set 12,000 years in the future or something like that uh, kind of uh, whitewashes a lot of the historical things that uh, you, you might object to otherwise. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. There's a chicken and egg paradox there. Well, not necessarily. Um, you can still have interstellar travel without faster than light speed. It's just that you need colony ships and you have to spend uh, centuries getting to places depending how fast you go. 
you know, the whole notion of traveling interstellar space with the spice, like the way that happens is kind of vague. It's not really clear if it's like some kind of a wormhole or some kind of teleportation, um, you know, but they're, they're able to move, you know, vast fleets and gigantic ships and so forth. And, uh, um, I, um, you know, you kind of get the impression it's more like some kind of teleportation just because no one ever seems to be freaked out about, I don't know, like the gravitational issues involved in a wormhole. I mean, no one ever seems worried about the technology, like the physical transformations that happen when you travel like that through space. So it seems like kind of treated more like it's teleportation. Yeah, I mean, Mike makes a good point. I mean, this is uh, the, the humans. Um, the human factor in in stories is is, is absolutely essential, or or the stories uh, are flat. I mean, it's just it's just a bunch of, of techno babble that that has no real meaning. It doesn't reach us uh, in, inside ourselves, and and and, and uh, we need the we need the human element. Um, and and the spice uh, is one way uh, of doing that because you can have interesting adventures by traveling across the universe or across at least across the galaxy by using the spice. But one thing I, I did, yeah, that's that's true too. Mike brings up another excellent point is that the people don't necessarily have to be human beings; they could be other intelligent beings or or, or uh, other creatures that could be interesting and, and affect us and we affect. But uh, <clears throat> one thing I did want to point out is that there are serious scientific papers now on warp drive, little space-time bubbles that you form around your, your spaceship so that you travel faster than light. Um, that, that is trippy. And I do think, you know, uh, the spice is probably analogous to the transporter on Star Trek. You know, basically Roddenberry came up with the transporter um, really just as a narrative device because he didn't want to have – um, you know, uh, he didn't want to have to edit in shots of like shuttlecraft or something like that, like landing on a planet and stuff like that. He just wanted to be able to get his actors, you know, to where the action is happening and from outer space. So he just came up with the transporter as a narrative device. And the, the spice is basically the same thing as that. It's just a device to get people to where you need them. So budgetary restrictions have led to technological innovation within the, within, the, within, the, within, the, within, the, within the, that series. Yeah. I think that's interesting about the teleporter idea. That just think of two things. How easy it is to get the audience to become accustomed to and accepting of all of these made up technologies and how quickly and um, deeply um, iconic uh, became the beam me up or beam me up Scotty line that uh, I've heard many times over the years. It, it reached a lot of people and uh, spoke to people's imagination. I've always been disappointed that Second Life never adopted the beam me up um, sort of uh, uh, emoji or whatever. Uh, instead, of, we, we all say TP, which sucks. <laughs> we, we should all be saying, you know, beam me over or beam me up or something, but Second Life never adopted it. Darn it. It may have been copyright issues. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it has proven useful. There Apparently there was a case where a guy was – it was in this big exam room, and he was. There were a bunch of people writing the exams, and he managed to finish his exam early. And he he stands up, and then suddenly everyone looks at him, and then he pulls out his wallet, flips it open like it's a communicator, and says, "Quick, Scotty, beat me up." <laughs> um. All right, gentlemen. I think we're just about at the as much time as we can do. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and and bring this to a close. Um, this was a lot of fun. And um, like I said last time, I will uh, get together and hash this out over a beer, but uh, all good things must um, I want to thank the Science Circle for hosting and helping to uh, administer this program and to our students for attending. And of course, most of all, to our fabulous panelists. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Since people are walking probably toward the bathrooms, I'll make a point that um, uric acid is a purine. It's a larger molecule. The larger molecules are a little more involved to metabolize, and they're excreted in the urine. And uh, purine itself comes from the word um, purin, uh, or Latin of purum meaning clean, and uricum, which means uric, uh, uric acid. So you get certain conditions and too much uric acid builds up, uh, you can get gout, and crystals of uric acid form in your joints or soft tissues and cause inflammation. And uh, crystals accumulated are a good way for scientists uh, in days when they had less um, detailed uh, investigatory techniques to get samples to look at. So uh, uh, normally uh, uh, uric acid is excreted by the kidneys along with uh, urea. Urea is uh, carbon with a um, uh, uh, I guess an SCO group on it, a double uh, bonded uh, to a carbon and a, an ammonia on each end, so it detoxifies ammonia. So you can think about that as you go to the restrooms now. <laughs>